Our oceans are on the rise. In polar regions, climate change explodes glaciers. Warming rivulets appear quietly in ice sheets, then grow until the sheets melt. In all parts of the Earth, as temperatures soar, oceans get hotter, then expand. Global sea levels have gone up and up over the last century, especially in recent decades. In 2018, global mean sea level was 3.2 inches above the 1993 average, the highest annual average on record. Each inch of ocean rise carries consequences for people. Globally, eight of the 10 largest cities are near a coast. In America, about 40% of the population live in coastal areas where sea levels affect flooding, erosion, and hazards from storms. Yet perhaps the most striking effect of rising seas is economic. Worldwide, the economies of families, communities, and industries are being washed away. This unites vastly different peoples around a common challenge, how to keep the land beneath their feet and their livelihoods from being swallowed up by the seas. My name is Chad Porche from Chauvin, Louisiana. This is my wife, Angela Porche, and we own Faith Family Shrimp Company in Cocodri, Louisiana. This is where we have a lot of product that comes in, and um, a lot of shrimp is caught around this area. Sometimes it's caught a little further up the bayou, but and they'll bring it down the bayou, and this is our dock. We serve the commercial fishermen in this area. My dad was a shrimper, his dad was a shrimper, and um, I, maybe even his dad. So when my dad first started, shrimp was worth gold, but eventually, the imports started flooding the market. So that's part of our problem also, um, why our industry has shrunk so much. We have four shrimp boats ourselves, big boats like this one, they're a little bigger, and then uh, we probably unload 30 to 40 boats. Different people, or most people that I've fished with my whole life. That used to be actually sugarcane fields, then it got to duck ponds, and now it's turning into open water. I do know that the water is rising higher and higher down here in Cocodri, and it is becoming more of a struggle to stay down here. Um, you know, we, we, we do have maybe a little fear that one day we can get completely wiped out down here with a hurricane, a number three or a number five, you know, and we'd have to move further up. Um, just for a minor storm the other day, it wasn't supposed to be anything. We had a foot of water over this dock. We lost our pallet scale and a few other things, you know. For Hurricane Barry, which was in July of 19, we had four feet. Where I'm standing, we had water to here. I think it's more land loss than anything, because uh, while we used to be able to trawl that, you, you know, you, while you used to not be able to trawl that, I should say, you can trawl now. So they could have a boat that's fishing right behind these trees where before that was all land. So it's just opening up. So boats can trawl where there was land before. And uh, on while we fished, I was never an inshore guy. I always was an offshore guy. So while we fished that, all of our beaches is gone. So we got beaches, but they're on maps, old maps. That's how we know where bars is at, why we can get stuck and why we can't get stuck because most of the land's already under. My dad used to bring me when I was a little boy on a boat and that's what I, it's more of the freedom. You, when you get up and you go to jobs and stuff like that and you're in a city or something like that, I don't even go to Homer too much because I just like, I like the water. I like the sunrises, the sunsets. Everything's just more beautiful, more peaceful. So you could actually jump on a boat and you go to work and you're your own boss and it's just peaceful. It's you and God. That's why we kept our bigger boats because even if all the land goes away, the bigger boats can still fish. The bar used to be filled with boats and now it's it's pretty much empty, like there's a handful of fishermen, that's it. You could see it with your own eyes, you know, anybody who lives here knows what's going on. Where there used to be a duck pond, it's a lake now, so it's definitely uh, daily, not yearly. A wave hits a piece of grass with marsh and it's gone. We just have faith, that's why we in it.
So here in Louisiana, um, our coastline is quite unique. And a lot of times when people think about coasts around the world, they think about sandy beaches. Um, and while we do have some sandy beaches that are our barrier islands, which are kind of our first line of defense when storms come in from the Gulf of Mexico, it's important to understand that it's the entire gradient that we have here that are our wetlands. And by that I mean from the, the northern end of the, the, the wetlands, we have our cypress swamps um, and very freshwater habitats that are home to our alligators and turtles and bullfrogs and those types of species. Um, and as you go south towards the Gulf of Mexico, uh, you start to get a, a uh, ever increasing kind of salinity, um, saltiness from the mixing of the Gulf of Mexico into our freshwater distributaries. Um, and so here our wetlands aren't just beaches, they're cypress trees, they're swamps, they're uh, marshes, um, and it's a, a whole variety of types of habitat that are home to a, a lot of species, both commercially and recreationally, very valuable. It's a delicate system, um, you know, because it's very flat, even the smallest ridge with some trees on it makes a lot of difference in how the ecology of the uh, area functions. Um, and so at the end of the day, wetlands are, are a diverse and productive ecosystem um, with a freshwater to saltwater gradient here in Louisiana and a variety of different um, plant and animal species. Louisiana, we're a coastal state and a lot of our communities as well as our economy depends on our coast. As sea levels continue to rise, we'll continue to lose land. Here in Louisiana, we already have a land loss crisis. We've lost 1,900 square miles since 1932 and with rising seas, we'll continue to lose even more land. That leaves our communities more vulnerable to storm events, hurricanes, storm surge, as well as the habitat loss that our commercial and recreational fish and wildlife depend on. Going out into some of these coastal areas, visiting some of our marshes, some of our bare islands, you can see the change that has happened and is happening. If you talk to local people in the area, they'll tell you things have changed over time. Um, while a lot of places talk about what climate change will do, here in Louisiana we've already experienced some of it. We're seeing those effects. We can look at the events like uh, hurricanes that are increasing in frequency and strength as well as rising seas. the Mississippi River that empties into the Gulf of Mexico through the state of Louisiana, um, which is the biggest river in this country. Um, and it uh, is incredibly important for the commerce that goes in and out of the middle of our country and out to the whole rest of the world. Um, so one of the examples I always like to point to is after Hurricane Katrina, um, there were farmers in the Midwest who had their grain just rotting in silos because they couldn't get it out the port of New Orleans. Um, and this port complex is just incredibly important both nationally and internationally. The oil and gas infrastructure, um, especially the stuff at Port Fouchon, which a 90-day closure costs $7.8 billion in gross domestic product nationwide. The state of Louisiana is actually kind of at the forefront with our uh, state coastal master plan of really addressing the challenges that lie ahead with climate change, with loss of our 
wetlands and loss of our coast. Yeah, so we're here at the Carnarvon Freshwater Diversion. Um, this is a project that was built in the 90s to reconnect the river um, with the wetland area to bring fresh water back into the area. Um, for years, more and more salt water had moved up into the basin, threatening the fisheries. And so this is a project that helped bring that back into balance. However, there's been a happy side effect. While it wasn't designed or located or even operated to build land, um, the, the sand and mud from the Mississippi River has actually built land out into the Breton Sound area in a place that was once just open water. In, in Louisiana, where almost every place is losing land, it's one of the few places where we can actually see land gain without us having to actually go in and rebuild land manually. Right now we're standing on top of the river levee along the Mississippi River. Um, over here is the Mississippi River. You'll be able to see there are boats that are actually actively using the river right now. Um, the Carnarvon Diversion structure is built into the river levee and is a series of gates that are opened. The water flows from the river through this gate underneath the road and then into the Breton Sound on the other side. So it's mostly pulling the water off of the top of the river, which is fresh water as well as um, this, the silts and clays, mostly the fine sediment. But despite being mostly fine sediment, it's still building land. The state's coastal master plan um, calls for us to spend $50 billion over the next 50 years, and you got to assume there's got to be some job creation and economic growth with that. Um, the water sector here in Louisiana is the fastest growing sector of our economy, and so there's a lot of potential for all levels of, of job creation around that, um, you know, from people who are laying pipes to move sediment and move water, the construction jobs that go with things like the mid barataria sediment diversion, um, and then all of the professional services that go hand in hand with that. I think there are a few things that people can do. One is to support the Coastal Master Plan. The Coastal Master Plan process is like the blueprint for what coastal restoration looks like in Louisiana. It's a plan unlike almost any place else in the world. I also think you can contact your local representatives either on the, the federal level, level or on the state level and tell them that you support coastal restoration and to make sure that coastal restoration dollars are spent wisely and on coastal restoration. Um, if you want to do hands-on work, you can go out and do plantings that happen, planting trees, planting grass in areas around our coast. That way you can see firsthand what these areas look like and what is being restored. What really kind of gives me the most hope um, looking to the future is the people of coastal Louisiana. Um, and by people, I mean their culture, their attachment to place, um, and really their commitment to being a resilient uh, community. So. Um, here in Louisiana, we face lots of natural disasters, uh, but in the wake of each one of those, we always seem to bond together and really rebound. And yeah, my kids, they do plan to take over one day. I mean, we are gonna get older and we're not gonna work, wanna work every day. And um, they're hoping that the, the fishing can continue. Erosion is, uh, is definitely here and it's affecting a lot, but we, we're not scared to change either, you know. We don't like change, but we, we do it if we have to. So like I said, if we have to move things more north, we will. God will make a way. God's going to open some doors. I mean, I see a lot of things that could happen. Um, you know, I love dealing with the people down here, and I just can't, I hope that, you know, future fishermen do, you know, come and build a relationship with us. And we see that a lot with the children of the older fishermen that we do have here. So it's kind of cool to be down here and get to make those relationships. Louisiana is our home. We stand with young people around the globe. Working to preserve our wetlands. Fight land loss. And make sure our children and our children's children can live in the places that we call home. Join us. Know the facts. Take action. Embrace hope!